Okay, so maybe we can start. Let me introduce uh, the speaker, Sabine. So it's a pleasure to have her continue the discussion of yesterday. And now she is going to talk about uh, tensor models and uh, their applications in general. So Sabine, you can start and uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so to summarize a bit, yesterday we started by reviewing um, the large expansion of uh, matrices. And then we went on with uh, tensors and we saw that there were a well-defined generalization of matrix model with now a melonic limit instead of a planar uh, limit. But we saw that in the context of um, random geometry, uh, they were dominated by these uh, branch polymers and that no uh, new universality class uh, was found so far. So then we went on to do some uh, field theory with those tensor models. So I uh, talked to you uh, briefly about this kind of SYK-like model. And then we started looking at the proper uh, quantum field theory in D dimension uh, called this uh, CTKT model. So with uh, quartic uh, interactions uh, here and three different interactions. And I ended uh, yesterday by uh, showing that this model had a well-defined large expansion and that it was dominated by this kind of uh, melon uh, tadpole graphs where the melons are based on tetrahedron vertices and uh, the tadpoles on pillow or double trace. Okay. Uh, so uh, today we are uh, going to see uh, the renormalization of this model and the kind of fixed point we uh, obtain um, in the large n limits. Okay. So first let's look at the divergences. So it's a quartic model. So actually the power counting is uh, the same as the usual uh, five four. Mm -hmm. Continuing as usual, a uh, five four model. So that means that in the in four dimension, we have uh, the two point functions that are uh, power divide power divergence, four point function that are log divergence, and higher than six points is UV convergent. Okay, so the fact that we have a uh, tensors uh, interaction does not change the power counting for the renormalization. And so for this model, we can do an usual uh, dimensional regularization. Regularization, and we set D equal four minus epsilon with epsilon small and not zero. And we will do a subtraction for the four point function, a subtraction at uh, zero momentum, momentum, zero external momentum, and a mass regulator, regulator. Okay, that's for our choice of uh, scheme. But anyway, here I will just present um, results up to two loops. So it's actually independent of this, uh, of this choice of scheme. Okay, so let's look at uh, the two-point function uh, first. And we can uh, look at this with the schwinger dyson equation. So I remind you the schwinger dyson equation, it said that the inverse of the two-point function is equal to the inverse of the free propagator minus the self energy. Okay. So here, this free propagator is just p square. And then we have to determine the self energy. But here, because of the large n limits, uh, the self energy is uh, known and it's a closed expression in terms of g. Why? Because we have this um, melon tadpole in the large n. So the self energy, which is the generating function of uh, one particle irreducible graph, I can have only three terms. So I could have with tetrahedron here, a two point function, which is just a prime melon. 
like this, except that the edges are decorated, decorated by the full uh, two point function. Okay. Because I know that all my, I must have all the, the melons. So in the self energy, I have, if I have only the prime melon decorated by the full two point function, this will generate all the melons. And then I have some tadpole term because of the pillow and double choice that generates tadpole. This minus the D and also the tadpole. And here it's again decorated by the full two point function. And this is um, in the large n limit, in the large n limit. Okay. And then this means that we have for the Schrodinger Dyson equation really a closed equation on G. And this is uh, really a key feature of um, melonic uh, theories and of this melonic large n limit. Okay. Then how to um, how to solve this? So we see that we have uh, two uh, regimes because here um, another color. So here this uh, this graph, this melon. Um, yeah, if you uh, write the integral, I will not do the, the the technical detail, but you can see that in the momentum it will scale like p to the d over two, okay? So here we can see that we will have two regions in this equation. If I go in the UV, okay, so at high momentum, then it will be the P square that will dominate over the P d over two. So that will mean that the two point function, the inverse will scale like P square and it's the free scaling. Okay. Scaling. Now, if I go into the IR, it will be P to the D over two that will dominate. So it means that G P minus one will scale like P to the D over two. And so we have an anomalous scaling. Anomalous scaling. And then if we um, neglect uh, see the free propagator in the IR, we can solve the Schrodinger dyson equation using this and that, g of p equals some function z, p to the d over two. And then z is the usual um, wave function renormalization. Wave function normalization. Okay. And um, so I'll skip the, the computation, but it can be done to find that Z has the following expression D over four, gamma three D over four. Or by D, lambda square, one fourth. Okay, and you see that here, if I um, put D equal four minus epsilon, this this will give me a gamma of epsilon. So this uh, wave function of normalization will be indeed of order um, epsilon. Okay, so that's for uh, the, the two point function in this uh, model. And now we can go on with the four point function. Okay, so for the four point function, now we have three quartic interactions. So we have to look at three different bar expansion and three different beta functions. So first we can look for the tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. But actually, if you study uh, the, the large n limit, and if you look in detail at the combinatorics, you will see that at large n, 
gets no adjective correction. Adjective correction. So it means that all the graphs that contribute in the large end limits, all the four point graph on the exterior legs, none of them will look like a tetrahedron. Okay, so that's, um, okay. So we will have in the beta function of the tetrahedron, we'll see later, only contribution from the wave function of normalization. But then for the pillow and double trace, we will have some uh, correction. So we can write the bare expansion. So what I mean uh, by bare expansion is like um, the renormalized coupling in terms of the bare one. So if I put this, this would be the renormalized coupling graphically, what are the contribution? I will have just a four point graph with only one vertex. So here it's a renormalized coupling. So either pillow or double trace, it's the same bare expansion. And here it's the bare one. And then what do I have? Because I had for the two point function, melons based on tetrahedron, and then tadpole based on pillow and a double trace. Here, I will have a sum of chains with um, ladders based on tetrahedron and bubbles based on pillow or, or double trace. So what I mean is that I will have something like this here based on a tetrahedron. Let's put a lambda square so that we know. Then I can have a bubble here like this. So that's either pillow or double trace, pillow or double trace. And then I can change the thing. So I can have something like this. Okay, then go. Etc. So that's the, the whole uh, bar expansion. And here, every time I have a ring like this, the vertices are tetrahedron. And every time I have a bubble like this, so here, or this one, those one, these are pillow or double trunks. Okay. So that's the, the whole uh, bar expansion that we need uh, to write uh, the beta function. However, at this point, we will have a mixing between pillow or double trace because there is a trace part in the pillow. So, um, okay, so without going to detail, we can do some reparametrization. Trization to make them orthogonal. So if I do a change of variable for my coupling, lambda one equal lambda p over three, and lambda two equal lambda d plus lambda p. So that will make them uh, orthogonal. And what I mean by this is that a graph like uh, this one, if I put here the lambda one interaction, it will contribute only to the beta function of lambda one. And if I put lambda two, it contributes only to the beta function of lambda two. So it means that our beta function will be uh, decoup decoupled with this reparametrization. Okay. Is it uh, clear how we obtain uh, this uh, bare expansion? Okay, so once we have this uh, bare expansion, we can compute the beta function. So the bare expansion that I wrote, you can write it like, so the renormalized coupling here, G1, we have some scale mu to make it dimensionless. Then you have the wave function renormalization and there this bare expansion. Okay, so 
here, what I wrote gamma 4100, it's this pair expansion I drew here for the coupling one at zero external momentum. And then it's the same uh, for uh, G2 with uh, two instead of one, mu epsilon z2 square. Okay. Okay, and we can do this up to uh, two loops, for example. So we will stop at this graph here. Uh, here, sorry, this graph. And I'll skip the detail of fixing the combinatorial factor and computing the um, integral, but at this point, it's very similar to usual 5 4. And then you can compute the beta function. Beta gi will be mu d mu of gi. And I will give you the result. For the tetrahedron, you find minus epsilon g plus 2g cube. Okay. And here we have uh, two interesting things. So the first one, as I said, because we reprimatrized with G1 and G2, you see that we have a triangular uh, system um, here. And the second interesting thing is that because we had no radiative correction to the um, uh, tetrahedron, here you see you don't have any terms in G square because you have just the uh, uh, the bar one minus epsilon g, and then this term comes from the wave function renormalization. So here you see that it's at this point that you really have something different to uh, the beta function you have for the usual phi four, and that um, the usual um, phi four that leads to the Wilson Fisher fixed point. So because of this, we will see that uh, the fixed points are actually uh, quite um, quite different. And so if you solve this uh, beta function, you will see that uh, you have a solution. Uh, you have, of course, the trivial solution. Trivial solution. But you also have one with a non-vanishing uh, tetrahedron. Vanishing tetrahedron with V G star equals square root of epsilon over two. But then if you uh, inject this into the beta function of uh, G1 and G2, you will find complex fixed point for the other one. So find G1 star, it's plus minus I square root of epsilon and G2 square, it, oh, sorry, plus or minus I square root of three epsilon over two. Okay, so we have this uh, purely imaginary, purely imaginary G1, G2. And it's quite a problem because it's a um, problem because of reflection positivity. Okay. And it's even more of a problem because if you look a bit more in detail at this, you can um, easily compute uh, the dimension of one operator or the single choice operator. So you can compute this dimension. Uh, how you can compute this? Because the, the dimension of this operator is half the dimension of the double choice. So you can find it by saying that is um, the dimension in the free phase. So one half of two d minus two, which would be the dimension um, in the free theory plus 
um, the critical exponent here, which is 2g2 square, g2 star. And you find that this is uh, complex. So what you have here, it's a complex CFT that has complex dimension of uh, operators. So it means that it's an unstable and non-unitary CFT. So it's not such a nice uh, results. So here we have uh, a theory with a new kind of fixed points in the larger limits, very interesting. But we found this problem that we have the complex dimension and this fixed point give rise to an unstable uh, CFT. So it's not so much uh, interesting um, if we want to apply this to uh, quantum gravity or ADS CFT in the same spirit as the SYK like model. Okay, so in the last uh, part, I will present you another model that will uh, fix uh, this problem. So before I go on to this, is there any question on uh, this model? Okay. Okay, so the model I will now present uh, to you is just a slightly uh, mod a slight modification of this model and it's called uh, long range. So um, the next part will be based on those papers. So mainly on those, uh, these two uh, papers. So with my supervisor, Hasman Guru and Dario Benedetti, uh, this one, these two were also with uh, Kenta Suzuki and this one with uh, David Deleter. Okay. So this model is very uh, similar to the previous one, um, except from one little thing. So we have the action here, I, A, B, C. And the modification here is to put a non-trivial power of the Laplacian, C plus S interaction. So this, here is the same as uh, for the CTKT model. Okay. And this power uh, zeta is what's called a long range model. Long range uh, model. Okay. So in this kind of model, zeta must be strictly between zero and one. So zero to have a well-defined well defined, um, thermodynamic, thermodynamic limit. And it must be uh, smaller than one to preserve uh, reflection positivity. Reflection Okay. And actually, this is this has been studied a lot in uh, statistical uh, mechanics. So, and it has quite a vast um, array of application. Array of uh, application. You have, for example, a lot of studies on the long range Ising model. And for a review, I can give you this. G two three by uh, Kampa Doxwa and Refo on statistical long range model. Okay, but here why we uh, do this? You can see when we have this zeta, then the canonical canonical dimension of the field will be changed. It will be delta phi equal d minus two zeta over two. Usually it's d minus two over two. And that means that when I have a quartic interaction, quartic 
interaction. Then it is irrelevant, relevant, if I choose zeta to be smaller than d over four. So then it leans to a mean field behavior. Mean field behavior. Then it is relevant if zeta is strictly above t over four. And then it's marginal when zeta equals d over four. And you see here, see why we chose this? Because here in this marginal case, zeta equals d over four. It means that our free propagator then Cp will be one over p to the d over two. And this is the uh, higher scaling we had before. So it means that here we are starting with a model that already matches uh, the, um, the higher scaling uh, we had for the previous, uh, for the previous model. So we'll see um, uh, soon how this uh, can uh, simplify uh, what we did uh, before and can solve our problems. Okay. Um, any question on this uh, long range? Because it's quite, um, uh, it's used a lot in statistical mechanics, but not so much in uh, CFT or normalization. Okay. So we can just uh, redo uh, some uh, power uh, counting like before to see the, the divergences. And if you choose zeta in the marginal case, t over four, and then d is strictly smaller than four, you can do the power counting. And it's actually um, the same as for uh, five four. So meaning that the two point would be, two point function would be power divergent. Uh, the four point function will be log divergent and above six points, it will be UV convergent. Okay. So um, here for the renormalization scheme, we will also do some DMREG, but actually because we have this long range, we don't have to, to change uh, the dimension of D. We can fix D. So it's a bit different. We have fixed D and then we put an epsilon on zeta. So it's um, slightly relevant. So D plus epsilon over four. And this is our uh, UV regulator. And it means that we can study our normalization at fixed D. So then we could choose, for example, D equal uh, three and it will still be a uh, rigorous when you do DIMREG in uh, four minus epsilon, and then you send epsilon to one to D equal three, like in the Wilson Fisher fixed point, is not uh, so uh, rigorous. And here it's really at fixed D, so we can look D equals three, two, one, et cetera. And we will also have a subtraction at uh, zero uh, momentum for the four point function with. Uh, Regulator new. Okay. So now let's see how uh, this um, zeta uh, changes uh, the Schringer Dyson equation and the two point function. Okay. So we still have the same interaction, the same large end limits. So uh, the Schringer Dyson equation will be almost the same. We have GP minus one except that now uh, the free propagator is not p square, it's p to the two zeta. And then I will have the same term, lambda square. The p, the tadpole, lambda d. So here the edges are still uh, decorated by the full two-point function decorated by full two-point function. 
and we are still in dim rec, so this is zero in dim rec, the tad poles. Okay. But if you remember what I told you before, when we had p square, we had to look in the uv that p square was dominated, and in the ir, p to the d over two was dominated. But here, when we choose zeta equal d over four, those two terms, this term and this term, have the same scaling, same scaling. So it means that we don't need to uh, neglect one with respect to the other, depending if we are in the UV or in the IR. So we can directly set the ansatz GP equals Z over P to the two, two zeta, so we have D over two, and solve this equation consist consistently. And if you do that, you will find an equation on Z, Minus z4 minus z cube equals lambda square 4 pi to the t over 4. And what we can see here that is really a um, characteristic feature of long range uh, model is that here for d strictly smaller than four, what we are looking at, this is finite. So it means that we have no wave function renormalization. No wave function renormalization. So it's just a finite rescaling. Okay, and this is not just a, a characteristic of uh, Melonic CFTs or tensor model, it's really a characteristic of long range uh, models. Okay. And now, because we don't have this wave function normalization, this will uh, change uh, the beta function I uh, wrote uh, earlier. Okay. Um, okay, so we have no term, no term from uh, the wave function normalization. But the bare expansion is uh, still uh, the same. So it would be uh, very similar. We have beta t equal just minus epsilon g. Beta one equals minus epsilon g one. Yes, yeah. I will define this in a minute. Okay, so we have this and just this coefficient alpha s zero, it comes from this graph. Uh, and because we uh, introduce this power uh, zeta, it changes uh, the results of the Feynman integral. Uh, and it's different than from the previous model that was short range. And I can give you the, exp the exact expression if you want, we can compute it analytically minus psi of one, where psi is the d gamma function. Okay, that's just some uh, details. And here, so two, um, two remarks. So first here, you see that now in this model, we don't have to keep epsilon uh, non-zero. We can send epsilon to zero. So I can actually remove this. 
and I won't have any uh, problems and I won't have uh, like a trivial fixed point. But the key thing is that in the short range, we had a competition between the epsilon and the G cube coming from the wave function normalization. And here in the long range, the beta function of the tetrahedron is exactly zero. So that means that um, G is actually a free parameter. Is a free parameter and it's just obtained as a, um, as a rescaling with uh, this z that is now uh, finite. So it's just that g equals uh, mu minus epsilon. Um, no, I took epsilon to zero. So just sorry, uh, z square lambda. Okay. Um, we just have to be a little bit uh, careful here when we want to um, invert this because of the, the value of Z. I can I have some GC uh, critical. So that is defined as gamma one, two, four. Um, four pi D, D over four gamma. Okay, so I did, if I define this GC like this, the Z I computed in the previous slide can be written as one minus G square over GC square. Okay. And if you write it like this, uh, if we consider the bare uh, coupling to be real, you can invert the by expansion lambda j invertible to g of lambda uh, for any lambda and z goes to zero when lambda goes to infinity but if we have lambda purely imaginary imaginary then lambda g is invertible only up to um, g smaller than uh, gc and z is bonded okay so we will see why uh, this is important, but it was just to point out that even if G is a free parameter, there is some uh, critical value above which we cannot go because uh, the two point uh, function equation we obtain for this Z will not be invertible. So even if it's a free parameter, um, if uh, lambda is purely imaginary, it will make no sense to study the theory above this value. Okay. Okay, so now that we have this free parameter, we can solve uh, the the beta function for the two for the two other couplings, and we found this fixed point. So I wrote everything up to uh, two loops on me here, but we did the computation a bit higher. G square minus alpha zero. Okay, so this is the fixed point for the long range model and G is just a free parameter. So since it's a free parameter, we can, in principle, choose its value. And we see that if G is real, G1 star and G2 star would be imaginary because of the square root of minus G squared, imaginary. And then we will have 
we will have the same problem as we had for the CTKT model. These couplings will be imaginary, and we will have complex dimension of bilinear operators, etc. But here we have some freedom on the value of G, and we can choose it to be purely imaginary. And it's not a problem to choose it purely imaginary because contrary to the pillow and the double trace, the tetrahedron does not have any pro proper, uh, positivity property. It's not the square of anything. So we can really choose G to be purely imaginary. And in this case, G1 star and G2 star for real. Okay. In this case, they are real, and we have four lines of fixed point. Four lines of fixed point. Okay. And this is really some uh, progress with uh, regard to the other model, because now we really have a real uh, fixed point that has uh, the chance to be stable or to lead to some unitary theory. And especially we can check if it's indeed uh, stable, we can compute the critical exponents. So because we have uh, decoupled uh, the pillow and double trace with G1 and G2, the st stability matrix is triangular. Triangular stability matrix. So the critical exponents are just the diagonal elements. And we can compute them, d beta one and g star will be plus or minus four or the g cube and d beta two of g star will be g square. Okay. And you see again that this is real if G is purely imaginary. imaginary. And if you choose uh, the plus here and the plus here, both are positive. And in this case, we have one on the fixed points, one uh, IR attractive. IR attractive. Stable fixed point. Okay. And we can even uh, draw um, the trajectory between those fixed points. So I can do the attractive one here. It's in the plane G1, G2. Okay. And I will have our trajectories. Okay, so you see here, this is the G1 plus G2 plus. So this one is um, attractive in both uh, direction. This is the G1 plus G1 plus G2 minus, which is attractive in one direction, repressive in, this, in the other. The G1 minus G2 minus, it's repulsive in both direction. And G1 minus G2 plus, attractive in one direction and repulsive in the other. But we have one that is really um, attractive and a stable fixed point. And that's really um, the main uh, progress with regard to the short range model when 
where they had only an imaginary and stable fixed point. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, yes, so that's for the fixed point. I will just, if I have time, yes, uh, do some remarks because, um, so here I presented everything up to uh, two loops, but actually we have a non-perturbative uh, result. Why? So when I presented you the, the bare expansion, you know, as a chain of ladders and bubbles, I just wrote it down up to two or three loops. But it's actually possible to resum it in uh, the large n limit because we have the idea is that we can break this in a chain on of one vertex irreducible pieces. And we have three possibilities, three types of these pieces. We can have some pure ladders. So what I mean by pure ladders, it's only with a tetrahedron vertices, something like this, with a certain, num a certain number of rungs. And for this, we can write a generating function. So let's call it UG. And it will have like g squared times this graph plus g4 times this graph, etc. Then we have something that we called uh, caps, where we have only uh, one uh, bubble. So it will be something like this. With a certain number of rungs. You can also have no uh, rungs at all. And this we can call it g. And it's the same, it would start with a um, lambda one plus something like lambda one g square times this one plus etc. And then you can have the double caps. That would be something like this. Certain number of francs and then another um, another bubble and this we call it T and we do something like lambda one plus lambda one square plus uh, lambda one square G square times this graph, etc. So this one, sorry, it's times this graph, etc. Okay, so that's the three uh, possible pattern you have that's for uh, one vertex reducible so by one vertex irreducible i mean you cannot uh, cut it in two by cutting a vertex and then your full four point function is obtained by uh, gluing uh, those uh, three kind of patterns uh, together in all possible uh, ways and if you look at it and you write it uh, properly, all the possible way to uh, glue that, to insert the cap, etc. You can actually resum this and show that the full uh, four point function, the full bare expansion will have this form minus u of g plus the one plus g square. Okay, so I'm I'm skipping a bit the detail the details because it would be um, too uh, technical. But you obtain this expression, and this is really exact. It's not a perturbative expansion. It's up to. Um, it's not a loop expansion. It's really exact, and these are series in uh, G, and they can go to um, as high as you want in loop uh, order. And so this means that when you have this expression and it's very similar for uh, G2, which you just have a three, um, points, you can um, derive this to obtain the beta function. And you will really obtain a beta function up to evolutes, non-perturbative. So with some coefficient, beta one G, G one plus 
beta to g, g1 square. So you see here, this is a quadratic only quadratic in g1 square. And those terms here, beta zero, beta one, and beta two, it's they are series in g square. Okay. And this series in uh, g square, we can um, we can show that uh, beta zero g, beta one g, and beta two g. It's possible to show that they are um, finite at all orders, all orders. If you do uh, the series in j, and that uh, the sum is also finite. Sum is also finite. If you resum them, it's also finite. So I won't do the proof uh, here, but um, just to tell you, it's done by using something called multi-scale analysis. If you're interested in this kind of non-perturbative renormalization with some um, Taylor subtraction operator. Okay. But I'm telling you this, um, because this means that thanks to the large end limits, we were able to write the beta function at all orders in the coupling constants. This means that uh, the line of fixed points I showed you uh, before, these lines of fixed points, they are actually non-perturbative. Non-perturbative. And the one stable fixed point we have Stable fixed point, it's a strongly coupled uh, fixed point. And it's really the advantage of having a large n uh, limit because we could expand in one over n. We did not need to uh, expand in the coupling constant in order to have uh, something uh, finite. Okay. But even though we know that these coefficients are uh, finite, uh, it's not possible um, yet, at least, to compute them analytically to all orders, and we could only compute them uh, up to three loops. So here, to, to have a shorter equation, I showed them up to uh, two loops. Um, here, I wrote up to two loops. No. Um, here in the beta function, I wrote it to two loops. But we were actually able to have the analytic result for three loops. Okay. Um, any question on this part on how we obtain the fixed points and uh, the non perturbative part? Okay. So now with this long range uh, model, we managed to obtain a stable infrared uh, strongly uh, interacting fixed point. So it means that in the infrared at the fixed point, we have this, uh, this new kind of CFT that we call melonic CFT. So now we want to investigate this CFT to see if it's uh, really a new kind of CFT, what are its property, is it unitary, et cetera. So I will give you some, um, some more information of this. So first about um, unitarity. So um, maybe let me give you some reminder about uh, some CFT data and, um, and OPE coefficients first. So to investigate unitarity, what we want to do is compute uh, the dimension of the bilinear operators and the OPE coefficient because we know that a unitary CFT must have real dimension of its bilinears and real OPE coefficients. So the OPE coefficients, they are the coefficient that appears here when I do this phi one, phi two, x two, this kind of, of equation in a CFT would be the sum over the primary operators, primary, 
some coefficients and here with uh, oh. okay and this is the op coefficient and to obtain these op coefficients we can use properties of cft because we know how the four point function will look. So the four point function look like I so I got four fields schematically. It will be a disconnected term plus a sum over spins integral here over d minus i infinity t over two plus i infinity. Uh, two pi and mu uh, hk and j inside. Okay, so here a uh, mu it's the measure measure. This is a conformal block, so it's a non function. And this is the um, eigenvalues of the four point kernel. Okay, so are you all familiar with this kind of uh, CFT formulas? Yeah. Okay, and and then uh, when you have this expression, uh, the trick in the CFT is to uh, deform deform the control the control um, and pick up poles and pick up uh, poles. And the only uh, contributing contributing uh, poles or the H M J such that K of H M J and J equal one, and these are exactly the dimension of bilinearals. And the residue at these poles are exactly C M J square, so it's the square of the OP of the OP coefficients. Okay. So that's just a little bit of a reminder on um, CFT, CFTs. Uh, is that okay for everyone or do you need some more um, explanation on the CFT? So this has nothing to do with tensors, it's just um, CFT. Okay. So in this story, the only place where the fact we have a tensor model will uh, play a role, it's here for the eigenvalues of the four point kernel. And because we have this tensor model where we know the large end limits, we know uh, the kernel in the large end limits. So the kernel is known in the large end limits. Okay, because we have um, the melonic dominance, then the kernel will have this form minus lambda p like that.
Okay. And actually, those two terms, if you do the computation, will not contribute, and we will have only contribution from uh, this term. Okay. Uh, and since we have this, um, I could give you. Um, Yeah, sorry. So I can give you now um, the uh, again values. Um, yeah, no, just the, the solution. So because we have this kernel like this, and we know here is the full two point function, we can compute the um, the again values because so it's like um, the diagonalized diagonalized by the three point function three point function so you can compute the eigenvalues and um, we inject them into this equation in order to compute dimension of the line by linears and the residue at this pole okay and so for example for the i can give you for the dimension of by linears the formula we obtain dimension of by linears, we obtain two type of solutions. So, like h not plus or minus, we'll have this one t over two plus or minus some coefficient here square root minus g square and h n t over two. Okay, so that's all the dimension of the bilinearals. And you see that it's a bit uh, similar to the dimension you're used to um, in CFT. So you have d over two, and then that's the bilinear with n um, derivative d over two plus two n, but then you have a correction here. And again, if you look at this expression, if g is real, you will have something that is complex, but uh, for G purely imaginary, for G purely imaginary, imaginary, um, you will have real dimensions. Dimension. And you can also compute this, the, the residue and have the square of, um, of the OPs. And we found also that um, in this case, we have real OP coefficients. Real OP coefficient. So it's not a proof uh, that the theory at large n is unitary, but it's really a strong, a strong hint. To prove it, we will need to compute the dimension of all uh, primary uh, operators. And there was uh, some um, more study that was done um, by um, Hasman Guro, Dario Benedetti, and Kenta Suzuki, where they computed a correlation uh, between so three-point function correlation and some more dimension, and they found a further hints of unitarity for this theory. So it's quite uh, interesting because we could have been afraid that because we have um, the tetrahedron coupling that is purely imaginary. Could have seen, oh, we have a complex CFT, it cannot be unitary, but actually it can. And um, all the data we've collected point uh, towards this theory being a uh, unitary at uh, large n. Okay. Okay, uh, any question on this uh, on this part, the computation of the bilinears and unitarity? No? 
Okay, so okay, so this is uh, great because we found this uh, new kind of fixed point, this melanic fixed point in the large and limit that can be uh, unitary. But all the results I've presented you are for exactly large n. So then we could uh, wonder what happens if we go to um, next to leading order. Okay, so uh, next to leading order. So what, what happens? And even more than just the next to leading order, uh, what happens if we look at different kind of large end limits, even for the short range model? But for the short range, so the question is, can we find some uh, fixed point with um, real um, uh, real couplings um, and a non-vanishing tetrahedron? So what happened in the short range with other limits? So what we did first, we went back to the short range and uh, we look at uh, different limits. So we look first at small n. We look at some uh, vector-like large n limits. So what I mean by this is like, instead of O n cube, you look at O n one times O n two times O n three and you send one end to infinity and you fix the other two. We also look at a matrix-like limit. So here you send um, two to infinity, where infinity and those two are fixed. And matrix-like, you send two to infinity and one is fixed. And we find that in all those cases, we have no fixed points. Uh, with non-zero uh, tetrahedral coupling. coupling. Okay. So then we really looked at the next two leading order for the ON cube, both in short range and in long range. And we find kind of the uh, opposite uh, situation. So for the uh, short range model, short range uh, model. We found that at next to leading order, um, the fixed points and the critical exponents, critical exponents acquire a real part. So it's still a complex CFT, but now it's, it can be really a stable fixed point and it's a true stable um, fixed point. But the CFT cannot be uh, unitary as we still have some uh, complex parts in the dimension of the bilinear. And in the long range model, long range model, we find the opposite situation. So at leading order, we had real uh, critical exponents and dimension of bilinears. And here we find that the critical exponents, they get complex corrections. So it means that we have a breaking of unitarity at next to leading order. So it means that those two models, short range and long range, they are actually very um, similar at uh, finite n. In both case, finite n, we have some uh, fixed points that leads to a non-unitary complex CFT. But at large n, they are really different. One as an imaginary fixed point and the other one as a real fixed point that can lead to a unitary, a unitary CFT. And so all this work looking at a different a kind of large n limit and small n and the next to leading order showed that there is only one model and one limit that can give us a um, fixed point with a non-zero tetrahedral coupling and real a critical exponent and a unitary CFT. And this model is the long range model in the strictly large n limit. And it's really the only case where we have this nice unitary melanic CFT.
Um, okay. Uh, okay, I have some time, so I can also say a few words. Um, okay, so um, I will say a few words about the last work uh, we did. Um, because now that we have this nice uh, metronic uh, CFTs, CFT uh, that can be uh, unitary and where we can do some analytic computation, we can uh, try uh, to look at uh, some uh, uh, properties of QFT and to look if they match for uh, this, um, this model. And what uh, we looked at was uh, the uh, F theorem. The F theorem. Okay, so this uh, theorem is um, a generalization, generalization in dimension three of uh, the C theorem. So the C theorem tells you that the central charge must uh, decrease along the energy flow. And of course, in dimension three, you don't have a central charge, but you can still find a quantity that will uh, decrease along the energy flow. And here it's the sphere free energy. Okay, and the sphere free energy will decrease along the energy flow. Okay. However, this theorem was proven only for a unitary CFT using some uh, relation between sphere free energy and entanglement entropy. So we wonder, can we uh, check this theorem for our long range model? And it was actually uh, non-trivial in the long range case because we had to, um, so we had to adapt this like non-integral Laplacian on the sphere. So that was first um, trivial, okay. And then we had to compute the, the, the full free energy. So I just want to give you an idea, so I won't uh, go into any detail about this, uh, uh, this theorem. Um, but the, the, the key point is that we managed to prove that uh, this theorem is uh, satisfied, satisfied for uh, the long range one cube. Uh, model. And it actually can be seen perturbatively, perturbatively as a reversal of a sign of a cooking um, constant along the flow. So, what I mean is uh, where was it the drawing yeah it's this drawing so we look at uh, the flow between this uv fixed point and this ir fixed point and along this flow to give you an intuitive idea we have the coupling g2 that just change signs you can see here it's really just plus minus and because this uh, changes sign, we will have a difference in the free energy here and here. And it's a um, positive difference, so it actually decreases along this flow. But I, will, I will just want to comment on why this is uh, interesting. It's because it's really a non-trivial example. Usually when uh, people um, check the F-theorem, so it was either before uh, the F-theorem was proven, so they took theory they knew were unitary and checked the F theorem for this theory. And then once the F theorem was proven, they could, for example, uh, try to look at a theory they knew uh, was not uh, unitary. And uh, either they knew it was not unitary or they wonder if it was. 
and they looked at a control example, et cetera. But in our case, we are not sure if this theory is unitary or not. They are just strong hints of, strong hints of unitarity at large n. So checking this F theorem uh, really gave a new non-trivial example of this theorem and also added some uh, more hints that our large n theory is actually unitary at large n. So more hints of uh, unitarity. at large n. Okay. Okay, so do you have a question about this? You want me to give a bit more uh, detail about this uh, particular um, uh, property of our model? Okay, so up to now, this is um, all we did on uh, this uh, specific uh, model, all the, the data uh, we, uh, we collected uh, for this uh, long range ONQ model in the quartet, in the quartet case. Um, however, it's not the only uh, possible uh, tensor uh, model, and I can uh, give you an overview of all the other tensor uh, models that were um, that were uh, studied um, in this um, in this way. So the model I just uh, presented. So I started with the CTKT, which is the short range, um, which is the short range uh, model, uh, and we saw that the fixed point was uh, complex and we it was not stable, uh, not a unitary CFT. But however, as I said, at next to leading order, um, we obtain a stable fixed point. Okay. Then the model I just uh, presented here, the long range uh, version, um, now we are in D smaller than four, and the fixed point of real, stable, unitary CFT, we just have a breaking at next to leading order. This model were both aquatic interaction, but then um, there were uh, studies on a sextic model, still with three indices. So the first one by um, Jombi, Klebanov, uh, Popov, Rakov, and Tarnopolsky, they did a model called uh, prismatic. So uh, with not all the possible interaction, but it was still quite an interesting model because they found a real fixed point, a stable unitary, and also a next to leading order. The only thing is it was not a um, full tensor model because they did not consider all possible uh, interaction for this, uh, sextic, um, for this sextic interaction. Then uh, I had uh, this uh, paper with um, Dario Benedetti, Nicola uh, Delport, and um, Hidam Sina, where we studied a model uh, with a sextic interaction. And here we studied uh, two possibilities for, for the sextic interactions. Sextic interaction. We look at two models. So um, one with a UN. UN cube, so still rank three, but bipartite uh, interaction, and one with uh, ON5. So the ON5 will be uh, just a generalization of the one I just presented to you. Um, and we did exactly what I just did for the ONQ model for uh, both those uh, models. So we computed the two point function, we looked at the four point function, beta function, etc. And we tried to look do we have the same properties as we had for the quartic model, or is it different? And it's different. It can, it can be an uh, a hint that uh, the rank we choose and the order of interaction is uh, really important. And it's actually the case because 
um, in this uh, UN cube, so still rank three, but sextic interaction bipartites, we found that in the short range, we have um, two stable fixed points, which was not the case for the ONQ model. And in the long range, very similar uh, to the ONQ, we have a line of fixed points, line of fixed points, okay? And then the big surprise was the ON5. Because the ON5 here, it was really just a generalization. So just let me go back here. Uh, wait, how was it? Yes, so the ON5, it's really just a generalization of this. Instead of quartic, you have um, six vertices and the tensor of ON5 but you have something that would be like a complete interaction and then some correction. And it's really just, uh, just the, the direct generalization in rank five. So we were expecting something really similar, like a line of fixed point and some unitarity. And we were really uh, surprised because in this case, both in short range and long range, we had only the Gaussian fixed point, the trivial fixed point. So we can see that um, the rank is actually um, a really important uh, parameter that will, um, and it's really the, the, the kind of fixed point we'll have depends heavily on the rank we are studying and that it's uh, that was uh, the interesting um, conclusion of studying this model and then we also looked at uh, i also looked at the next two leading uh, order for uh, these uh, two uh, models uh, so not for the one five because we don't have an interesting fixed point but here uh, for short range and long range and here at next to leading order, we find that it still um, exists. Okay. Uh, but it's not unitary in this case. And this line of fixed points, uh, surprisingly, we find that there, that there is no precursor. So at next to leading order, the correction of uh, non perturbative in epsilon. So we have no precursor of these fixed points. So again, the situation is very different from the ON cube model. And it's um, another um, signal that uh, this uh, long range ONQ model I presented you is uh, very uh, particular. And this kind of fixed point is really uh, dependent on the rank and order of the uh, interactions. Okay, and uh, to be uh, complete, I would just uh, would like to mention some other models uh, that were uh, studied and give you some uh, references. So here, all this model, it's like ON cube or UN cube when you consider the fermions or just a complex bosons, uh, but you can do a really a different kind of uh, symmetry. So you can study some uh, supersymmetric uh, models. Uh, super uh, symmetric symmetric uh, model. So here you have a paper from uh, Popov and one from FD and Vicky. Uh, you can also study uh, some uh, fermionic because all the models are presented here are bosonic, but you can study some fermionic models. Dominic uh, models, uh, mainly Prakash, uh, Sina. There was also study of a tensorial version of the Grosneuve model. So this is um, Benedetti. Uh, 
Okay. And uh, I have to mention also, there was study of a multi-matrix model. So it's matrices, but you have a high number of uh, matrices. So uh, instead of the tensor where the three index or the three index or the tensor, you will have two indices that are the indices of the matrix. And one is the index of the number of matrices. And you can have some uh, similar uh, behavior in the larger limits. And that was studied by uh, Ferrari, Rivasso, Okay. Um, yeah, so that's an overview of all the other uh, symmetry uh, you can uh, you can uh, study. Um, however, um, this kind of melonic CFT that I presented with this uh, unitary um, kind of CFT is really only for this um, kind of uh, bosonic, uh, bosonic model. Um, but they are still interesting, uh, especially the fermionic uh, models, because they can uh, give rise to generalization in higher dimension of this SYK-like uh, model. So they are still uh, of Interest this fermionic model, tensorial gross model, uh, etc. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm a bit uh, ahead of time, but I will um, still uh, go. As, except if you have question, I will go on with the conclusion. Okay, so um, in this uh, lecture and in the second part, we uh, studied uh, tensor models for strongly coupled QFTs. And we saw that uh, they give us a third family of large n series that is both rich and tractable. So by rich, I mean that because of the, of the melons, we have uh, some bilocal uh, insertion. Whereas for uh, vector uh, models, you only have uh, in the larger limit, if you know a bit vector models, you only have this kind of uh, cactus, um, cactus diagrams with only local um, insertions. And then they are tractable because the melons are subsets of the planar diagram and they can be uh, more easily uh, recent. Then we saw that um, in uh, 1D, they can reproduce SYK like uh, physics without um, disorder. And finally, we saw that in higher dimension, uh, they give rise to a new uh, family of uh, CFTs called melonic CFTs that can be studied analytically. And especially we saw that for the long range point cube, uh, this melonic CFT is uh, unitary at large n, not strictly large n. And because we can study it analytically, 
uh, this allows, allows us uh, to test uh, properties of uh, QFT in a rigorous uh, setups. And especially we could test the uh, F theorem uh, rigorously uh, for this model. So that's uh, the, um, the state of the art on uh, this uh, model, but of course there are still uh, open uh, questions. So um, open questions. Okay, so um, about so higher order interactions. So I mentioned it a little bit already, but can we find a model? Can we find a similar fixed points? So for safe stick, we saw that um, it's not so far we haven't, but maybe there are other types of model we could uh, look at can also have uh, different um, symmetries. Especially recently, it was uh, proven, uh, so in rank three and five, um, rank three and five, that a symmetric uh, traceless tensors and also anti-symmetric anti-symmetric, it was recently proven that they have also a large end limit. So it's not uh, the same uh, kind of uh, tensor model, the color tensor model I presented you, it's with more symmetry, but they do have a large end limit. So um, what about uh, QFT based on this model? This model. Could we find something interesting in this? Okay. And then uh, interesting, but very uh, long-term question, since we have this new kind of uh, CFT that is unitary, what about, um, what about uh, the ADS uh, dual? So can we compute it? What is it? And there was uh, already some work in this uh, direction by um, Melocock, uh, but it's, um, so it's a hard question because we have an um, factorial growth growth of the uh, invariance. So I mean with the order of the interaction, when you have just quartic, we had three invariants, but then if you go here, sextic, eight, etc., etc., you have you have a factor of growth of this, and it makes it hard to find the uh, ADS dual. So okay, so in the context of ADS CFT, it's a very interesting question, but so far. Um, there was a very little progress on it and it's a very uh, long-term question. Um, okay, so I'm a bit ahead of time, but I think I will uh, stop it here and we can have a um, longer um, question session if you have any uh, question on this or what I talked about yesterday. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yes, yes. Ah, okay. I have a question actually. Yes. Uh, I've seen that in the F theorem, you, you are taking the sphere free energy, right? Yes. Uh, why are you choosing this parameter? Just because it's decreasing or there is something more behind it? Oh, yes, because it's the one that is, that, um, that is decreasing. So just for um, that. Yeah, yeah. So the F theorem is, so the F in F theorem, it's really the free energy on the sphere. If you look just as the free energy, not on the sphere, 
it's not the right parameter that will decrease along the energy flow. And um, so this uh, appears when they prove really the F theorem for unitary uh, theories, um, because they could link the sphere free energy to the entanglement entropy, but it's not true for just the free uh, energy. Um, and you can also see this, it's also uh, useful to have the sphere because this uh, gives you automatically an um, IR cutoff also. But yeah, but it's not us that shows the sphere, it's really this theorem is for the sphere free energy that is true. And is it, is it valid also in other dimensions than three? No, so the F theorem is really for a dimension three. Then the C theorem is for dimension two. And in dimension four, you have another theorem called the A theorem, which is the other anomalous um, uh, dimension uh, that is decreasing. So really in all dimension, you have a different uh, quantity that is decreasing, decreasing along the LG flow. So um, can we say, because we know that in even dimension, uh, uh, the, these theorems are related to the anomaly. Uh, so we yeah. can say something uh, regarding the all odd dimensions, like, okay, we have something like an F theorem for any odd dimensions. Uh, I don't know. I think so far there is no uh, claim like this. They, for the moment, there is only D equals three with the theorem, and I don't think uh, anybody studied other odd dimension yet. Okay, thank you. Don't have any other questions? Can you go to the conclusion slide? Uh, yeah. Uh, this one or the one with the open questions? Yeah, with the open question, if you can say, I mean, what are you working on right now? Uh, are you working on these particular points that you have, that you are addressing? Uh, no, right now I'm going in a different direction, but I can still uh, mention it, yes. So, um, okay. So when I presented the, um, the fixed point and we computed the critical dimension, we saw in uh, some cases, so either in the short range case or in the long range where uh, the tetrahedron was real, that we had uh, some... Um, dimension of bilinear that had the form D over two plus a purely imaginary equation, so something of this form. And um, it was actually proven that when you have a CFT with uh, this kind of uh, complex dimension, you have an uh, instability. instability. 
uh, at the level of the CFT, I mean, you have uh, you have a breaking of some uh, symmetries. Uh, but it was also conjectured that you could have a, a non-zero uh, web. But actually, this uh, was not uh, computed uh, yet. And the, okay. So I'm looking at a bit of this. Uh, we know that we have a breaking of um, of some symmetry when we have these complex dimensions that appear, but we don't know how to uh, compute the, the non-zero web and if uh, this conjecture is actually true. And then the second point is that, um, so this was proven using the fact that when you have this kind of complex dimension, it's exactly on the principal series of uh, the CFT. But what if we have something like D over two plus some small epsilon plus i alpha. Is our CFT still, un still unstable? Still unstable. So this uh, we don't know. And so I'm starting to uh, look at uh, this problem. And related to uh, this problem, if we have this kind of uh, instability, it would mean that we must have must have another solution of uh, the Schringer Dyson equation that will not be the conformal solution. So, if uh, so, the Schringer Dyson equation for this model, I can color it with something like this. P to the two zeta uh, plus we had the lambda square. Yes, and the key. So that was our Schringer Dyson equation. So, since when we have this dimension, we have some breaking of uh, the, the CFT is unstable, it means that we must have another solution that is uh, more stable. So, a solution that is not, so the solution was GP called Z over some P to zeta, we must have something else. And since we think this will have a non zero wave, it should be some kind of a massive solution like GP, some other other Z, or something like P to the two zeta plus M to the two zeta. But we don't know exactly um, the, the form of this. So what I'm also looking at is uh, trying to find another ansatz and another solution of this. But if you go um, beyond the conformal ansatz, this is much more complicated to solve. So we have to um, uh, so we have to find new uh, methods, and maybe this would be uh, possible only uh, numerically. And this is also a bit uh, beyond uh, tensors because these kind of dimensions can appear in other kind of models. And especially when it was uh, conjectured, it was a model of uh, two uh, coupled, um, it was two coupled SYK uh, models that had uh, this kind of uh, dimension and instability.
Okay, I think we can uh, close the, the lecture. Thank you, Sabine, for these two uh, days of lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, Thank you. And uh, we'll see you with uh, all the others if you want. In the uh, next week, will be another appointment of the GGI TH Lift. Thank you again, Sabine. That was very Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Thanks. <laughs> And thank you for the invitation.